Hi everyone and welcome back to another history lesson with me, Miss Horn. How you guys doing? So we have been slowly working our way up through the age of industrialization or the age of imperialism, however you want to call it. So today we are going to talk about European nationalism and really what that means and what that looks like. So first and foremost, you should know that nationalism and patriotism are two very different things. So nationalism is this idea that you have like pride in your country and their national ideas. To be patriotic means that you, you know, it's like 4th of July, you know, craziness. And there is a difference because nationalism really means that your country is so great that you can go out and do all of these things that they did in the age of imperialism, whereas just patriotic is, you know, America, right? So we're really going to look at, you know, what Europe looked like during this time. And we're going to start with the Congress of Vienna, and then we're going to go all the way through to the unification of Italy and Germany. And I'll explain more about that. So <clears throat> the Congress of Vienna happened in 1814 to 1815. And this was basically Europe's reaction to the French Revolution and Napoleon. Because you have to remember, at the end of Napoleon, he wanted to unite all of Europe under a French empire, which caused complete and utter chaos within each of the countries and within each monarchy of those countries. So it was just chaotic and people didn't like it. So the kings slash ministers of Europe's major powers met to redraw the map of Europe. And their goals was this idea of conservative conservatism. And that just basically means that they wanted to go back to the quote unquote good old days. They wanted to keep it where you had the rule of legitimacy with the monarchs and to really establish a sense of balanced power within Europe and also to prevent another Napoleon, which is really funny when you think about history. And this was led by the Prince of Austria. Austria is a major power player during this point in time. Okay, so the idea of conservatism was basically that change and reform was 100% completely rejected and that they would return to the divine right in absolutism, so absolute monarchs. So everything that the American Revolution stood for. Everything that the French Revolution stood for is now gone. Newspapers and magazines were censored. <clears throat> Political comments and cartoons were absolutely forbidden. Uh, committees were set up to report troublemakers. And there were absolutely no protests allowed. So you can see where things might be going with this. <clears throat> As a result of the Congress of Vienna, progress stopped for a few years. Europeans insisted on rights and a voice. And the words of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen won't die so easily. And so soon, nations that were ruled by others ended up fighting for freedom and the legacy of the French Revolution and Napoleon would forever remain the same. And those ideas were patriotism, nationalism, and the idea of self-determination. So patriotism is just love for your country, right? Nationalism is having so much love for your country that you are the best in the world, and that entitles you to go out and make certain decisions. And self-determination basically is what it sounds like. It means you yourself and the countries themselves have the right to determine whether or not they are ruled by a king or ruled by popular vote or
So, let's talk about the Italian unification for a second. So first and foremost, you should know some names of leaders. You have Giuseppe Manzini, you have Count Cavar, Giuseppe Gibaldi, Gibaldi, and then King Victor Emmanuel II. And I'll explain all of this in just a second. So you also have Pope Pius IX, who also plays a pretty good role in the unification of Italy. And the Pope lives in the Vatican City, which is in the heart of Rome. And it is a standalone little country. So what you should remember is that after the fall of the Roman Empire, Italy was, you know, many independent city-states like going way back in the day to like each individual territory was governed by themselves. So that meant that each of them had their own flags. They, you know, had the ability to govern themselves and that was all fine and dandy. Italians would, however, begin to feel that one United State would strengthen them. So this idea of the res Rivimento, which is revival, is born. And basically, this is just the revival of Italy and putting people back together. So three leaders emerged to achieve this. You had Giuseppe Manzini, who was a writer. He dreamt and wrote about a unified Italy. And he also founded an organization called Young Italy in order to achieve the unification dream. He also wrote a lot of inspiring books about the dream as well. And I, I love this quote. Love your country. Your country is the land where your parents sleep, where is spoken that language in which the chosen of your heart, blushing, whispered the first word of love. It is the home that God has given you that by striving to perfect, perfect yourselves therein, you may prepare to ascend to him. Very eloquent. Then you have Camillo di Cova, who is considered the brain of all of this because he is the minister of Sardinia, which is one of the tiny islands that would become a part of Italy. And he used brilliant diplomatic maneuvers to unite most of the city-states by 1860. So this is a image of what it may have looked like for Corova and uh, Napoleon III of France to discuss unification because France controlled a part of what would become Italy. So then you have Giuseppe Garibaldi, and he provided the revolutionary forces, and they were known as the Red Shirts, and he would overthrow the government of Sicily, another one of the islands, and he schemed with Cordovar to join Sicily with Sardinia. So now, Victor Emmanuel is officially the king of Italy. So that's the king of Sardinia. Dun, dun, dun. So after this, you have a unified peninsula, and this is the <clears throat> cartoon, it's a British cartoon entitled Right Leg in the Boot at Last. Uh, and this shows um, Garibaldi helping Victor Emmanuel to put an Italian boot on because King Emmanuel would be the one to unify Italy officially. And then you have um, Garibaldi defending Rome against the French troops, which... They would ultimately win. The red shirts would unite um, with Cava. So this is showing you Sicily and then saving Rome and uniting all of Italy for the first time. And this would be the flag. The official kingdom of Italy would be established in 1871. Now, <clears throat> this would send great pride throughout all of Italy because for the first time, you know, they had beaten the French multiple times at this point. And so they started to see themselves as Italian and not just Venetians. 
And that's where this idea of nationalism comes into play. So let's talk about the German unity or unification. So the precursor to this would be the Zollverein uh, in 1834. It was a German customs union that was led by Prussia. So, and this was to stimulate trade and increase revenues in the area. There were no tariffs on products traded between the member states. All German states, except for Austria, were members by 1853. And economic unity kind of trumped political unity in this instance. And so to show you what this looks like, here it is. So to point some of this out to you, this is Germany here, and this is what would become <clears throat> Denmark a little bit later. So you have Prussia here, right? And then you have the various German provinces that are included in this compact. So who are the key players in the unification of Germany? Well, you have Kaiser Wilhelm I, Kaiser is, you know, king. You also have Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. And he believed in this idea of real politic. He was, he had his blood and iron speech, which we will take a look at, and he was considered the Iron Chancellor. It's an epic mustache, if I can say so myself. So Otto von Bismarck actually believed the less people know about how sausages and laws are made, the better they'll sleep at night. So basically he's advocating for hiding some of the truth from the people in order to protect them. This is something that government has, especially to this day, still continues to practice. It's better to keep their citizens in the dark on certain things so that they can sleep better at night. He also said, to never believe in anything until it has officially been denied. And lastly, the great questions of the day will not be settled by speeches in a majority decisions that was the mistake of 1848 to 1849, but by blood and iron. Basically stating that the blood and the hard work and the building of a new country is what will change. And make better decisions. It's pretty, pretty tough. Bismarck was pretty cool. I'm bored. The great things are done. The German Reich is made. A generation that has taken a beating is always followed by a generation that deals with one. Some damned foolish thing in the Balkans will provoke the next war. Dan did kind of did. <laughs> Man. He must have had a crystal ball. So the German Confederation, uh, this is like pre-1860s. So German-speaking part of Europe was many different European states. It's very similar to what was set up in Italy. So this is, again, you see Prussia. You have the Austrian Empire down here. You've got Baravia, Moravia, Bohemia. These are all different regions within Germany. So you have the Netherlands. Denmark, Sweden, Belgium, all the good stuff. All the good stuff. So, what does King Wilhelm do exactly? So in 1861, he inherits the throne of Prussia. Uh, and his goal was to unite all of the German states under Prussia. How would he do this? Well, he would force them to do this. Uh, that's when Otto von Bismarck, the prime minister, used the policy of iron and blood. And basically, Wilhelm was like, Prussia will force all to join them. You don't have an option in this case. So step number one was the Danish War. So they fought Denmark in order to get part of their own land back from them. So this contested piece of land here. Then you have the Austro-Prussian War. It was considered the Seven Weeks War uh, and it happened in 1866. And they fought over 
Prussian land. So shortly following the victory of Prussia, Bismarck pressures other states to join in. So this would create the Northern German Confederation. So he's balancing between peace and war. God, I love these propaganda posters. They're amazing. So number four was the Franco-Prussian War. They had taken on everybody. So Bismarck maneuvers to uh, maneuvers France to declare war on Prussia. France loses, of course, because Bismarck knew that it would. No big surprise there. So Prussia is really setting themselves up to become a dominant force in the area and to unite everybody together. And the Prussians actually seize Paris in 1871. And this is an image of a butcher selling unusual type meats to the masses. Gotta give you a second to read those signs. Okay, so the seize of Paris, I mean, it was really, really quite sad. Zoo animals were sacrificed in order to help Parisians survive. The and then lastly, you have the end of the war. France faces defeat. So, in the Treaty of Frankfurt in 1871, since France was the one to declare war on Prussia, France would be forced to pay a huge indemnity, basically war reparations. They had to pay 5 billion francs to the Germans. Yeah. And they would continue to be occupied by German troops until it was paid. Oh, yeah. So if you are ever wondering why France and Germany hate one another for the majority of history, this is the reason why. Not only that, but France was forced to give up the alice Laurent, Laurent, excuse me, region. So this is the territory right here in northern France that separates Germany and France. The Rhine River also runs right through here. The reason why this was so important is because the region was rich in iron ore and it also had a flourishing textile industry. So the Germans basically force France to pick a fight. Like Germany is over here poking France, you know, like I'm not touching you type deal. I'm not touching you. And then France ends up getting mad and ends up losing a lot of stuff. So losing Alice of Laurent would actually be nicknamed the terrible crime of 1871 because the French would never forget this. Never, ever forget this. And it would come up come to that. So this is an image of what it would have looked like between Bismarck and Napoleon III at France's surrender. Napoleon III to Bismarck said this, I might forgive you, history might forgive you, but the French people will never forget you. It wasn't a threat, it was definitely a promise because the French would never forget how Germany stole this region from France. And then you have the coronation of Kaiser Wilhelm I, officially in 17, 1871. Uh, and he would become emperor of Prussia and Germany, or what would eventually become Germany. So Germany was now united. They were a country that was modern Germany, and it was established with Kaiser Wilhelm the first. And this would become the German imperial flag, what we know of Germany today. And this would actually start the Second Reich, because the Third Reich would come a little later. And Reich, by the way, is German for empire. So this is the Second German Empire. So food for thought. How does Germany achieve its goals in all of this? Well, 
in summary, self-determination. Italy and Germany are perfect examples of how the force of nationalism led to independent states to join into a new nation. So nationalism can also work another way. Can f the force of nationalism can lead people under the rule of a foreign power to fight for their independence like it did in Haiti. Um, when it comes to Germany and Italy, it was just a sense of a shared language, a shared background, and a shared understanding kind of united all of them together. Very similar to what we have here.